Uh, thanks to at home for joining us this hour. Very happy to have you with us. So um, today was the day that a larger dynamic suddenly became very clear. Um, but today, I think, was the culmination of something that started to happen a few days ago, um, a little bit under two weeks ago. The first sort of crack in the dam is something that we saw just less than two weeks ago. It actually feels like a year ago now, but it was May 9th, which is less than two weeks ago. And that was the first one. Uh, that was when the president and the Trump administration more broadly started losing these battles that they have been waging now for a while to try to lock down everything, to try to lock down every witness, every document, every source of information about the president, to lock down everything in the wake of the Mueller investigation, to block anything from coming out. The first crack in the dam, the first one uh, that they lost was when the judge in the ongoing Roger Stone case issued an order commanding the Justice Department to take out the redactions from the Mueller report that pertained to the case against Roger Stone. Um, the, the, the judge ordered that the Justice Department had to take out the redactions about the Stone case, also about the dissemination of documents stolen by the Russians during the Trump campaign, also about the potential involvement of the Trump campaign with the entities that were feeding those materials out to the public to benefit Trump's campaign. The judge in the Roger Stone case, less than two weeks ago, ordered the Justice Department to unredact all the material in Mueller's report on those topics. And she told the Justice Department that they needed to show her that unredacted material. I, I really think that was the first crack in the dam. I mean, the Attorney General is saying, no, they won't release the redacted parts of the Mueller report. No way, no how. Oh, wait, a court order from a federal judge? Well, yes, ma'am, right away. Here you go, right? That was the first one. That was May 9th. Then we got the next one. Another federal judge, this one was late last week, the judge in the Michael Flynn case, ruled that the Justice Department also has to unredact the parts of the Mueller report that have to do with Mike Flynn. Uh, and, and in that instance, the judge in the Mike Flynn case, he doesn't just want to see the unredacted Mueller report himself. He actually ordered the Justice Department to release that material to the public. So by the end of next week, despite the attorney general saying, no, 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 he won't release the redacted parts of, of the Mueller report, no way, no how, by the end of next week, per federal court order, those redactions are going to be taken out of the Mueller report, and we, the public, will get access to that part of that report, whole and uncensored, by order of a federal judge. Then just today, we got the next crack in the dam as the Justice Department caved just a little and agreed uh, that despite their earlier stonewalling, now they will go ahead and they will release intelligence information and counterintelligence information that was turned up by Mueller's investigators in the course of his probe. The Intelligence Committee in the House has frankly been entitled to this information all along. They should have been given this information as a matter of course, but in the end it took a subpoena which the attorney general first tried just defying, just not responding to that subpoena. Then the Intelligence Committee scheduled a vote to hold the attorney general in contempt for defying that subpoena. And then finally, that apparently was enough. The, the department caved and agreed they would start handing that stuff over. Which just goes to show you, you don't always win when you decide to fight these battles, but you definitely can't win unless you do fight. <laughs> and sometimes when you do fight, you do end up winning. So uh, the redacted parts of the Mueller report, the attorney general said, no, no, no way, but those are starting to come out. The underlying materials from the Mueller report, the attorney general also said, no, no, no way, but those are now starting to be handed over to. Then we got another crack in the dam in another part of the Trump administration. This happened last night when someone leaked to the Washington Post the internal legal guidance that had been prepared at the IRS making clear that the IRS itself knows that under law, it must hand over President Trump's tax returns to the Ways and Means Committee. The IRS's own legal analysis says this is not a discretionary thing. This is not a judgment call for the Treasury Secretary or for anyone else. There is no wiggle room here. This is mandatory. And the leak of that internal IRS legal memo Last night to the Washington Post, that has not yet resulted in the IRS actually handing over the president's tax returns as required by law. 
But the IRS and the Treasury Department are now defying a subpoena to hand over those tax returns. That means their defiance of that subpoena will soon land them in court. It will not help them in court that the agency itself turns out to have put in writing that they know they need to hand over those tax returns. I mean, incidentally, it will also not help them that there are people inside the IRS who are willing to provide that kind of utterly damning material to reporters in order to blow the whistle on their own bosses. And meanwhile, the dam is still cracking, uh, including in new and exciting places. Um, Today, Albany, New York, the state legislature in the state where the president lived his whole life and where he headquartered his business interests. Today, the state legislature in New York voted that they would provide the president's state tax returns to Congress if the tax related committees in Congress believe they need to see them. Now, there's no sign yet that the Democrats in Congress will take up this offer from New York State, which is offering to give them the president's state tax returns. But if the Democrats in Congress do ultimately decide to go that route, it is expected that those state tax returns would likely contain much of the same information as the president's federal tax returns, which he is fighting so hard to keep secret. And all that has happened in less than two weeks. And and it's just the start. I mean, Now, today, for the second time in three days, a federal judge has ruled that financial institutions subpoenaed by Congress to hand over materials related to President Trump, those financial institutions must comply with those subpoenas from Congress. On Monday, it was a federal judge in Washington, D.C., who ruled valid the subpoena that the Oversight Committee had sent to Mazars, an accounting firm that the president and his business worked with for years. That subpoena directs Mazars to hand over 10 years of records of their dealings with the president and his businesses. That was Monday. Today, a second federal judge, this one in New York, ruled from the bench that a similar subpoena sent to Deutsche Bank by two other congressional committees, that too is a valid subpoena, and Deutsche Bank must comply with that subpoena. And just like the the ruling in the Mazars case on Monday, this ruling today on the Deutsche Bank case, it is blunt and unequivocal. We just got in the transcript from this from this hearing today, including the parts of the transcript where the judge reads his ruling from the bench. Part of that ruling, quote, The court concludes that plaintiffs have not raised any serious questions going to the merits. The plaintiffs in this case are President Trump and his family. Um, The Supreme Court has likely foreclosed the path that plaintiffs ask this court to travel. It is well settled that the committees possess the power to issue and enforce subpoenas of the type challenged by plaintiffs. Quote, the committees have alleged a pressing need for the subpoenaed documents to further their investigation. It is not the role of the court or plaintiffs to second guess that need, especially in light of the court's conclusions that the requested documents are pertinent to what is likely a lawful congressional investigation. Quote, in the committee's words, plaintiffs' contrary argument ignores the clear and compelling public interest in expeditious and unimpeded congressional investigations into core aspects of the financial and election systems that touch every member of the public. The court agrees. So the dam appears to have been poorly built. (laughs) If it has formed all of these different cracks in less than two weeks. But as all of that information that the White House has been trying to block from coming out has nevertheless started to come out, sort of all in a rush now, now we've got this incredibly dynamic situation in our national government, right? where the White House is pledging massive resistance. Clearly, it is not working. Their approach is losing every day now. This thing is slipping away from them, including, crucially, on the issues that the president seems to be most emotional about, meaning his finances and tax history. They're losing those battles, right? Meanwhile, Democrats are in flux and in very active discussion amongst themselves as to whether or not they should open impeachment proceedings against the president based on the behavior described in Mueller's report and based on any number of other potentially impeachable offenses they think the president may have committed. But as the White House starts losing all of these battles in an accelerated pace now, right, as the courts his own agencies, right? As, as they start, as the, as the conflict between Congress and the rest of the Trump administration, and, and the Trump administration 
has Congress winning and the Trump administration losing on all of these different fronts, right? And as the Democrats scramble amongst themselves and have serious discussions amongst themselves as to how to best move forward, how to keep their heads, move forward, and make sure they are both taking seriously their responsibilities as the governing body that runs the House of Representatives and also their responsibilities to the Constitution to make sure this stuff is investigated, as all that proceeds all at the same time. Here's just some perspective on how you might, you might expect this to go from here on out if this were a more normal time, right? So much is remarkable and astonishing about this presidency and its scandals. But a, a president and a presidency being in serious jeopardy, right? A president being at risk of impeachment. It's not like this is an unprecedented thing in our country, right? We have been through that before. We therefore know a little bit about what American politics and governance can look like in the midst of this kind of crisis, this kind of scandal. I mean, just, just take a look at DC at the height of the Watergate scandal. April 1974, House Judiciary Committee had been conducting an impeachment investigation into President Richard Nixon for months. Seven of Richard Nixon's closest advisors and aides had been indicted, including his former attorney general and his former chief of staff. Special prosecutor was about to subpoena the Oval Office tapes, a fight that that prosecutor would eventually win at the Supreme Court. We now know, looking back on that time, April 74, that Nixon was only four months away from resigning the presidency. But what, I mean, what, one night in April 1974, NBC Nightly News had three different segments on three different aspects of the investigation into President Nixon. This is what the media landscape looked like then. The House Judiciary Committee expects some kind of White House answer by tomorrow in its request for presidential tapes. And there was more talk today about in the committee about subpoenaing White House material. Senator Lowell Weicker said he has evidence that the Nixon administration from its very first days used the Internal Revenue Service and other government agencies to control its political and ideological opponents. In the New York trial of former cabinet members John Mitchell and Maurice Stans, this is the week for the defense. Former Cabinet member Robert Finch will be called as a witness tomorrow, and another defense witness this week will be W. Clement Stone, the multi-millionaire insurance magnate who gave millions to President Nixon's campaigns. So that's all the same newscast, right? That's what watching the news was like in April 1974. It's like disastrous scandal news about the president, other disastrous scandal news about the president. Furthermore, some disastrous scandal news about the president. Can we get, do we need to take a break? Right? I mean, multiple congressional investigations, looming impeachment, Nixon's former White House aides, the most senior officials in the government, on trial. Right? Things could not have been in more of a crisis mode in the spring of 1974. But here's the thing. All of that that you just saw, all of those different elements of the Watergate scandal that all made it into that nightly news broadcast that one night in April 1974, none of those were what led that same nightly news broadcast that night. What led the newscast that same night, April 8th, 1974, was that President Nixon and the democratically controlled Congress had just passed a big new piece of legislation. They just passed a big new minimum wage increase that would put extra money into the pockets of tens of millions of Americans. Good evening. President Nixon today signed into law a far-reaching increase in the federal minimum wage. The measure will now extend minimum wage protection to an additional 7 or 8 million workers, and ultimately about 54 million Americans will be covered. This is pretty much the bill which Mr. Nixon vetoed just seven months ago, but he was in high spirits today when he signed it into law at the White House. The president put out a written statement saying he had some reservations about part of the minimum wage measure, but that on the whole, the legislation contains more good than bad. Nixon with a big grin, high spirits at the White House. And you know, like on the one hand, on its own, that leading nightly news that night, that should be sort of, you know, sort of unremarkable. It's basic politics, basic governance. Republican president and Democratic Congress disagree over bill, negotiate anyway, sign a compromise into law, the American public gets a raise, right? But in context, think about that. This is at the peak of Watergate. Nixon and Congress are mortal existential enemies at this point. And yet here they are, enacting a broad minimum wage increase. 
And this wasn't the only big legislation passed during this period. A couple months after the House Judiciary Committee launched its impeachment investigation and Nixon was forced to appoint a new special prosecutor after firing the first one, in the midst of all that, Nixon signed the Endangered Species Act into law. A law written in large part by the White House and negotiated with the hostile Congress for nearly a year. In the summer of 1974, literally the day after the Supreme Court ruled against Nixon and unanimously ordered that, him to turn over the White House tapes, that day he signed into law a bill creating the Legal Services Corporation, which provides public defenders, provides legal aid to poor Americans to this day. That bill was a compromise that Nixon had negotiated with the Democratic Congress. I mean, this was barely two weeks before he was forced to resign. And he's negotiating with the lawmakers who are getting ready to impeach him. Negotiating with them and successfully agreeing to create this big, new, landmark, super important federal program that survives to this day. I mean, right up until the end, right, the business of legislating and governing went on. And that isn't a Nixon fluke. Same thing was true during the investigations and the impeachment of Bill Clinton. October 5th, 1998, the Republican House Judiciary Committee voted to launch an impeachment inquiry into President Clinton. Just between then and the end of that year, which is when the House actually voted to impeach him, President Clinton signed over 150 bills into law. And yes, yeah, some of those were like, you know, naming post offices and stuff, but some of it was major legislation that he proposed and negotiated with Congress, even while Congress was investigating him for possible impeachment and then ultimately impeaching him. I mean, just two days after the impeachment inquiry was opened into Clinton, Clinton signed an education bill with new programs he proposed to get disadvantaged students into college to reduce student loan interest rates. A few weeks later, Clinton persuaded Congress to fork over more than a billion dollars to hire 100,000 new teachers nationwide. A week later, he signed an expansion of the Head Start Early Childhood Education Program. Remember, this is with a Republican-controlled House that was not keen on government spending even when it wasn't preparing to impeach the Democratic president who would have to sign anything they passed. Oh, and also in the meantime, Clinton got Israel and the Palestinians to sign a peace agreement, got 160 countries to sign on to a pact to fight global warming. And earlier that year, he managed the Good Friday Peace Accords in Northern Ireland. I mean, neither of those presidents, Nixon or Clinton, while they were being investigated, or in Clinton's case, actively impeached, neither of them said, you know what? <clears throat> I'm not going to do anything else. I'm not going to work with anyone. I'm not going to work with this terrible Congress unless these investigations into me end. Neither of them even tried that. I mean, if anything, they seem to want the opposite. Both of them, understandably, were eager to give the impression that they were fairly unfazed by whatever scandal surrounded their presidency. They were unfazed by these investigations. They remained focused on doing the people's business. That's how it's gone in the past. Our current president, by contrast, uh, is, shall we say, phased and very, very willing to show it. I just wanted to let you know that I walked into the room and I told Senator Schumer, Speaker Pelosi, I want to do infrastructure. I want to do it more than you want to do it. I'd be really good at that. That's what I do. But you know what? You can't do it under these circumstances. So get these phony investigations over with. I'm not going to do even the things I want to do unless you get these phony investigations over with. And you know, who knows? It is possible that this bizarre spectacle from the president today was all planned out well in advance, right? Maybe it was, it was on the secret White House calendar we don't get to see. Today was maybe on that calendar. Today was always going to be Wednesday, fake impromptu Rose Garden speech demanding all investigations cease or the American people's roads and bridges will get it, right? Maybe that was always what they had planned for today in the Rose Garden. They did have a pre-printed sign on the podium today when the president stood up there to make those comments. I don't, know, I don't know how long it takes them to make those pre-printed signs. That said, there's also reporting today that suggests that the president was driven absolutely bonkers by Nancy Pelosi and other Democrats telling reporters today that they believe the president is engaged in a cover-up 
of Mueller's findings and the potentially impeachable behavior described in Mueller's report. So, you know, maybe this wasn't long planned today. Maybe this really was a spontaneous outburst from the president. Maybe he really was driven mad by this allegation that he's engaged in a cover up. I mean, it seems weird. I mean, of all the things Democrats have said he's done and that he has been described as doing, cover up is the one that really stings him, the one that really bugs him for some reason. I mean, you might expect that, like, being an agent of a hostile foreign power would be the one that would really stick. But apparently he doesn't mind that one. Cover up. No, don't say cover up. Or the country gets it. I mean, it's so random. Maybe being accused of carrying out a cover up is the thing that drove him mad today. And this was a spontaneous outburst. I think, though, it is also worth considering whether the holy grail is sort of upon us now. And the thing the president most cares about, his financial history, his banking history, his tax history, whether that whole financial history and everything it will say about him related to this scandal and not, that stuff is now getting pried open on multiple fronts all at once, right? In two different federal courtrooms in the past three days, in a state legislature in the state where he has lived since he was born and where all his businesses are based, at the IRS, where the shaky ground they've been standing on and trying to avoid handing over his taxes, that shaky ground is quickly turning into something that seems like quicksand. I mean, other presidents in times of crisis have tried to keep on carrying on in terms of, you know, appearing to have a legislative agenda and it, in fact carrying one out, right? Finding common ground, moving forward, doing the people's work, looking unfazed. That is not how this one is gonna go, apparently. So what do you do if you have a job in this government, right? What do you do if you are trying to run Congress <laughs> or part of Congress? If you're trying to think about legislation, if part of your job is occasionally needing to meet with this guy, when he has just declared government over, unless everybody leaves him alone and stops investigating him. I mean, how do you plan your work day around that? The Democratic leader in the United States Senate is Chuck Schumer. He was right in the middle of all of this today. He said today that what he saw from the president today would, quote, make your jaw drop. Senator Schumer joins us live next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.